Cool, man. I think we're all good. Should we just let it rip? Let's do it, man. All right. Charlie B, how's morale? Uh, it's good. It's good, all things considered, you know? I mean, we're in crazy times, obviously, but, you know, having uh, as much fun as we can. Yeah, man. It's what The future of comedy is weird. I, I feel like you're in a good spot, though. You're a bit, like, protected in a sense because you're not, like, 100% doing stand-up. You're working from the online platforms as well. Do you, do you feel good about that? Yeah, and, um, I mean, that's sort of the name of the game. Whatever business you're in is you just got to diversify your uh, revenue streams to a certain degree so you can continue doing what you love in down times. But... I think beyond that, you know, I started off doing, well, I started off doing stand up and then went to doing videos online, but the online videos kind of are what made me um, able to sell tickets. You know what I mean? Sure. So it's not a bad thing to double down on those because I wouldn't be a very good stand up comic if I didn't have the online videos because nobody cares, honestly, how good of a stand up you are. They just care how many tickets you can sell, venues, ah. I should say. You know, uh, yeah, so, the dark underbelly of the entertainment industry. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, and the truth of it is, is you can go out if you're a bad stand up, but you're good at making videos and you can do an entire tour and have a terrible set. But that'll probably right. be the last tour you do because you can only fool people so many times into buying tickets, yep. you know, yep. that I mean, I feel like. Man, I feel like you work harder than any anybody I know in music or stand up. I, I mean, <laughs> the rate you're putting stuff out. Have you hit burnout recently, or do you ever feel trapped by some of the YouTube stuff just because it's so goddamn successful that you just have to put out so much stuff? Well, <clears throat> no. I mean, I've certainly had those feelings, and you know, in those weeks, maybe you put out. Uh, you know, you just re-upload a, a video or something like that, or you take a break for a week or whatever. That doesn't often happen because, um, for me, I just really enjoy doing it, you know? And, um, and there's not much I'd rather do rather than, you know, create stuff. And, um, yeah, I just enjoy it. And I think that makes it a lot easier. You know, for me, it's it's less of a job, more of like a passion. And, um, you know, if I wasn't doing that, I'd be, you know, kind of like creating something else, I guess, you know. Was there like an office job or maybe like a memorably like totally shit job that kind of scared the life into you to work on stuff you really wanted to work on? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there have been many. Uh, I mean, I grew up, I've been working since I was like 11. You know, first I was sorting yarn at a yarn house, you know, and then mowing a lot of lawns. Uh, worked at Annie Ann's as a pretzel roller, so I can roll a pretty mean pretzel. Like the super pretzels or the little ones? The big, um, big ones. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't um, that be psychotic if you had to roll like the tiny pretzels like by oh, hand? Yeah. You know, I we used to do that for fun, you know, but uh, that wasn't too much fun. Yeah, It's actually, it's a, you know, this is the motion to roll a pretzel. That's <laughs> that you, you do this and then you got to get the flip down. It's, it yeah. takes a minute. It's kind of like tying your shoe though. You never forget do, it. Do you remember when super pretzels came to like the mainstream home market where you could buy them and like bake them yourself? That we, was a big deal. We sold some of those. Yeah. I, I used to sell at least, um, you know, two of those kits a week, not to sit here and flex on you or anything, but yep. I mean, that was the one thing I was good at in that job. You know, I was terrible with customer service, but I would, uh, for whatever reason, be able to sell a couple of those pretzel kits. Yeah, I remember like Sunday nights watching Malcolm in the Middle, you know, with my family and like, the, you know, I'm like 12 or 13, like a growing boy. And it, you remember those times where you could oh, just yeah. eat a full box of super pretzels and feel no aftermath from it. Oh, you're talking about your, so you're saying on one of the big boxes, so not the tiny pretzels, but not like the mall size pretzels, not the, not the mall pretzels, si but not, the in yeah, not the mall size, Right, not like the NBA sporting event pretzels, right. but yeah, right. yeah, yeah, mid mid tier yeah. those, pretzels. Those were flex. good. Too. Those were always a little hard for me, though. They would uh, cut up the roof of my mouth. I ate them too fast, is what that should have been an indicator of. But were you a big cereal guy growing up? Yeah, I was actually. Thanks for asking me that. Um, my my main, I mean, my birthday cereal was Lucky yep. Charms. 
Yeah. But I was also into Fruity Pebbles. Uh, now, these were not cereals. I'm one of 12. So if a cereal like this was in the house, it was gone that morning. Like, so right. Fruity Pebbles would be gone that morning. Uh, Lucky Charms, gone that morning. And if you weren't the first person to it, there were no marshmallows left. Because my brother would just do one of those super dumps of marshmallows. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Just pick the box. Yeah. Uh, what that's a bastard. A, that should be penalized with jail time. If yeah, I'm, yeah. I mean, I don't think I'm out of line saying that, but you know. What about, I always felt like cookie crisp should have been kind of illegal because it was just like a million small cookies tricking yeah. kids into thinking it was like a, a legitimate breakfast. K kids knew what was up. I think it was tricking the parents. Kids were like, are these, are they kidding me right now? Yeah, that yeah. was, cookie crisp was great. Um, I wasn't as much into cookie crisp. Uh, although I would eat the hell out of it. In fact, there was, if there was a box right here right now, I'd eat it for sure. Yeah. The whole thing. What was the what was the cereal that like was sort of banned by your parents? You know, there's like that one cereal where like that's definitely candy. Well, hmm. I don't think there was one. They would, but they wouldn't get them often. So you know what I mean? So they would get maybe one uh, Lucky Charms for every 12 like checks. Yeah, uh, you know what I'm saying, um, and uh, and that's okay, you know. But it, it was more of a special treat kind of cereal. Maybe once a week uh, they would get yeah. one of those boxes, and then watch their kids just like piranhas, like kill each other for this bowl of yep. boxes cereal. I, I get it. And I, the weirdest thing is like being as into the cereal scene as as i was and analyzing it and consuming it and you know sharing it with my friends never in those 15 16 years did i ever see one human being eat a bowl of wheaties you know wheaties is one of those now i'm i will i do think it was rare to see someone eat, unless they were olympians or michael jordan but those were on commercials. And I've eaten a bowl of Wheaties. There's that Wheaties aftertaste. That's just nasty. I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's like you licked a pull-up bar or something. <laughs> and like, exactly. it's, a, it's supposed to make you strong. I don't get it. I mean, yeah. they're still in business. Um, I mean, yeah, thank, thank God for Michael Jordan. Yeah, uh, they are still in business. Are you eating cereal these days? Uh, when I go to my parents, they're still into it. They still have the same like cereal shrine cabinet. So there's wow. still stuff in there, you know, but it's evolved a little bit. Uh, great grains, you know, the raisin bran, which is definitely a trick cereal into thinking it's healthy. But yeah, yeah it's, it's good stuff. Of, they just like crank it with sugar and raisins have a lot of sugar, too. The, I'm, a, the, I'm a big uh, raisins fan. Raisin bran? No, I just oh, like raisins. raisins. As a, are raisins shrunk in grapes? Yeah. They are. Yeah. That must take forever to make a box of raisins. No, it'd be less time than you think. They dehydrate them. They got that process down, man. They've got, you know, decades of work into the raisin industry. I mean, if we can put a man onto a moon, you know, which some will say we have not done, it was Stanley Kubrick, but that's a whole yeah. other story. Yeah. But if we can do that, uh, we can, you know, shrink a grape into a raisin pretty quick. Yeah, it's I the believe. wonders of technology, to be honest with you. I think, uh, well, one of the one of the one thing we, I think we should talk about is how we kind of reconnected, which is kind of a wild story because um, yeah, it is I, it's wild. I, I was seeing like your name online, seeing your pictures. I was like, that name sounds familiar. That that face is familiar. And then I put put it all together and realized we went to grade school together, Orchard, Orchard Lane, Lane Elementary. Baby. New Torture Berlin, pain. Wisconsin. <laughs> Unreal. Were you uh, were you there when the guy? Were you still in at, at the school when the guy brought the knife to school and wanted to stab me? Uh, who was that? Who brought the knife? Well, I I don't know. He's still like around. I don't want to say his name online. I don't know like <laughs> if he's a kook still or not. But uh, I got I got to tell you the story. Um, so there's this kid. We'll call him Gary. There were, we'll call him Gary and. Uh, he was a real nice kid, to be honest, like um, quiet kid, never said much. I was like his partner for some computer lab projects. Like we were friendly, thought everything was cool. Um, but he was like 
obsessed with pro wrestling. That was like mm. his lifeblood. That's all he watched. So there was this buzz around the school one day that Gary is running around picking out a new person every day to beat the shit out of. And mm. so three, four days went by. He's like, yeah, I'm going to today. I'm going to beat the shit out of Nate. And then you'd see Nate out in the yard getting a face wash, just horrifying, just crying red right in the face. And then the next day he's like, oh, I'm going to beat the shit out of Wes. And then he would be punching Wes in the face. And it was totally Wait, horrifying. Wesley? Wesley, is that who you're talking about? You know, Wes. Yeah. 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 Um, and so the fourth day rolls around and this buzz around the school goes, all right, Brett, He's coming for you next. You're the guy. I'm like, what? I never did anything to this kid. I was friendly to this guy. And I see him in the hallway and he's like, he's in like Undertaker voice or like some pro wrestler voice. He goes, Brett, tomorrow you are mine. I'm going to kick your ass. And I was like horrified. And I, and I, the only thing I said to him was, whatever, whatever, man, I'm not scared of you. That's all I said oh, to him. Oh, no. That was all you needed to say to Ooh, him. Wrong move. So... This buzz starts buzzing around the school the next day that uh, Gary brought a knife to school. Are we and talking, he wants me dead. Are we talking switchblade, Swiss Army knife? What, what do we got? Well, just wait. So, Oh, sorry. We're going I'm ruining back, the story. We're going yeah. back into the classroom. And you know how they make you line up in the hallway to wait to go back in the classroom? We're in yeah, line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My totally buddy true. Casey Kaiser, a great man, he goes, he whispers to me, I'm going to go check in Gary's backpack to see if he brought a knife. And so we all go in. He hangs back. Casey Kaiser doesn't come back to school for the rest of the day. So I'm like, oh, shit, something's up. And um, I get called into the principal's office like two hours later, and there's two policemen in there. Oh, shit. And they sit me down. They start asking me questions. And there's this giant kitchen knife sitting there with my name written on it in nail polish, bright red nail polish, Brett Wisniewski all across the giant blade of this huge, it's like Shut a up, Freddy dude. Krieger kitchen knife. Yeah. Shut up. No joke. And um, it was horrifying. I was crying and my parents got called. They were crying. It was, it was horrible. Um, but nothing really happened to this guy. All they did was relocate him to the other school across town. No. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> really? So he got expelled. He got expelled, but no real... No real repercussions. Nothing. Now, what's he yeah. doing today? I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I don't know who this is. And after I'll this... I'll tell I'm you gonna, off screen. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, he's probably in accounting or real estate or something, is my guess. Yeah. I, hopefully he's he He's probably got a back. normal job is what I'm, I'm trying... I'm not trying to say anything about, you know, accountants or real estate agents, you know. Not that Do you ever... Go ahead. Do you ever like go back through Facebook and look at pictures of bullies from your childhood? <laughs> um, I don't think I've done that in any. Uh, I I'm sure I've gone back and looked at people who were, you know, I guess I guess so. I guess so to some degree. Sure. Not in any real way. <clears throat> Recently, I'm sure I've done that, though. It's always surprising because like you say, you're like, these are people that like ruined the early years of your life. And then you look at them online and they have like kids and they're married and they're wearing a suit. You're like, what? Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? Yeah. It's just like, I don't know. Kids are such assholes. You know, I don't know <laughs> what it is. I don't know what it is about a certain age, but you know, you don't know who you are and you have nothing to really contribute to the world in a lot of ways, or at least you may, th you know, think that I, I I'm trying to get into the child mindset because here's the other thing. <laughs> Both my siblings are teachers and I've had to go, I mean, I do stand up for a bunch, you know, a bunch and I've gone in and talked to their classes. Terrifying, terrifying, you know, Oh yeah, because you are immediately put back into that sort of school grade school mentality you know people are talking while you're talking it's like bro what's going they're heckling you i'm like oh my gosh you know <laughs> it's the worst in the comedy store right now you know yeah 
What was it like for you, like growing up in grade school? Were you, did you know you had a sense of humor or were you kind of a terrified little guy like yeah, me? Yeah, no, I was, I was a shy fella for the most part, uh, you know, just trying to get by. I mean, I was always writing. I was writing songs for a while, you know, um, I, I was always writing. Writing was always kind of my sort of escape or the thing that I enjoyed doing uh, the most. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but I was always a, like daydreaming. I was never interested in the class that was going on. I was just trying to think about, you know, how I would become a, like a rock star, you know? Good, good. Yeah, I remember like, I remember feeling that and like trying to pay attention in class, but being so pumped about some like, better than Ezra album I had or something or, or <laughs> yeah. whatever that or thinking about guitar chords that I couldn't pay attention and for a while I just thought I wasn't smart because I was getting like B minuses and like C as I'm like oh I'm I'm I guess I'm not that smart but in in a sense like we talk about it all the time like the public school system is just not set up to encourage any sort of creativity whatsoever yeah honestly I don't, I don't know enough about the current school systems or whatever, but certainly I didn't really feel, you know, in my, and I did both. I did public school and I did Catholic school and they're both the same, you know, stuff, you know, for the most yeah. part. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it is. I mean, look, anytime you got 20 kids, if you're a teacher, you got 20, 30, 40 kids in a class, depending and you got to teach them, you know, the thing that you're mandated to teach them by the state or the school or whatever. And those teachers, uh, and it's brutal for them, you know, like all yeah, these, yeah. all these little shits, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking about my childhood. I'm not calling kids little shits, although they probably are, but no, uh, I was a little shit, you know, everybody yeah. was. And, and you're just trying to get through it, you know, so I can't blame them. I mean, that's a tough, that's a tough task. I think, I think we should pay be one teachers of the jobs. What's that? I think that's got to be one of the toughest jobs you can do. Oh, totally. Totally. And when people are like, we don't pay teachers enough. I'm like, really? They're like, it, they, what they do, you know, is directly related to what happens in the future, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like, um, but, uh, you know, I think. Yeah. You have to have, it's like a specific genome. You have to have to do that job. Because I mean. You know, I would, when I lived in uh, Vietnam, I would teach guitar, you know, for three hours a day. And, you know, that's one or two kids at a time. And I would just be cooked by the end mm -hmm. of like one or two sessions. Like I had to take a nap <laughs> and that was like two kids, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. It is. It's tough. It's a tough gig. It's a tough gig. What do you think you'd be doing if you weren't doing uh, comedy? Where would you be at? You think? I'd probably be a shitty lawyer somewhere, you know? Uh, <laughs> like a good guy or like a slimy guy? I'd probably try and do environmental law and, you know, something and be bad at it and then just go corporate, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just work for an oil company or something like that. Uh, just go to the other end. No, I don't know. I mean, I was doing journalism for a while and then I was producing, you know, actually before I got started doing stand up, I was producing at um, uh, Fox, uh, 20th Century Fox. Uh, and I was not, you know. It, it just wasn't my passion, you know? I just didn't want to um, develop those shows or whatever. Was this so. in Los Angeles? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was yeah. in L.A. Yeah, yeah. But I, Do you I feel did like a, L.A.? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I said I worked all over the country, really. I did a bunch of different jobs. But um, but what about L.A.? Do you think L.A. is kind of like like done? Do you think it's going to bounce back mm -hmm. as like the, the Mecca? You think it... No, what it's, do you think? it's toast, man. Look, I, I say that and I have no idea, but like you pay right now. Like I went out to L.A. because I wanted to, you know, be an entertainer and you don't have to do that. You don't have to go out to all you have to do now is believe in yourself enough to try to make videos or music or whatever and keep trying and enjoy the process and get good at it. And you can develop a fan base anywhere, you know, so. Yep. And the agents have such have less power. You know, the you don't need an agent these days. In fact, the agents right. are trying to get, you know, get into your stuff when you're successful. Yeah. And you don't. I mean, I have a manager, I have an agent, but you don't need either of those. And and you can do it all. You have all your platforms. It's never been 
a better time to have a creative mind because you have so many platforms to to make it happen. And yeah. TikTok, I mean, say what you want about it, you know, being owned by the Chinese government and then stealing all of our <laughs> data, which I'm sure Facebook and Google are doing as well. Um, TikTok probably a little bit more egregiously, but uh, that's a platform that, you know, you can hop on and develop a huge following very quickly, you know? Yeah, yeah. I do um, feel like the LA thing was like, um, it was almost like a default mindset that entertainers, musicians, actors would have. Like, if I want to do it, I have to go to LA. And it's just, it's like too much talent in one place. It's like you, it's like the same reason you couldn't have five Michael Jordans on one team. It wouldn't, they wouldn't get along. They wouldn't all get playing time or get all, get all the jump shots, you know? So I think we're seeing this decentralization of LA and maybe even New York. And my hope is that like all those talented people will kind of like spread all over the country and just make great little arts hubs in some of the medium and smaller cities, which would be great for everybody. And we're seeing that. And that's a very hopeful and good thing because, um, you know, it's all group think, you know what I mean? The, it, we're, we're, we're just malleable people, you know, humans are very malleable. So you kind of, um, become a little bit the place that you live in. And so that's why, you know, Brooklyn has a vibe and LA has a vibe and all this and that. And it's nice when, you know, you see <clears throat> Georgia, New Orleans, Austin, Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, uh, Cleveland, even you see a bunch of these, as you're saying, these arts hubs popping up and, uh, p you know, people don't need to do that. And that's a good thing. And, and th their stories then change, you know, there are stories in Milwaukee that nobody really would have cared about, um, uh, from an entertainment perspective or a film perspective, you know, 10 years ago. And now you're starting to see a lot more content produced about these smaller places. And, and that's, that's a good thing to see. Totally, man. And I really appreciate that about you. Like you really rep your home state and you're, you know, you've become a voice for it. And, uh, you know, Wisconsin, we've got our problems. That's, that's for damn sure. But, um, I do feel like it's, it's such a quality state that people don't really know about and it's really unpretentious and there's a really great art scene and it's friendly and, you know, you got the Friday night fish fry and the yep. old fashioned, you know, the whole thing. So, um, anytime people come here and visit, um, I'm always pumped to show it to them and they're generally pumped and talk about Milwaukee and stuff when they leave. Although no one seems to really come to Milwaukee on purpose. It's almost like on accident. And they're like, Oh, this is pretty great. I know. I know. Well, and I think that is And really anywhere, uh, you go. Well, I think Wisconsin has something special. I think there's something uh, of, of all the Midwest states. I think Wisconsin has like a very unique sense of pride about it. And I think it's reflected in um, sort of these quirks we have and also our sports teams. You know, I mean, the Green Bay Packers, I think, are actually a great example of this. There's no it's the smallest market uh, NFL market in the country. And nobody would stand for them going to Milwaukee or, you know, Madison or something like that. Well, you they know. used to play in Milwaukee. Remember that when they played County two Stadium. games a year at County Stadium? Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. No, like they, no one was pumped about it, so they stopped doing it. I know. It's just because Lambo has such a vibe to it. And the fact that it's owned by the community and everything uh, is, is awesome. And um, so I think it kind of starts there. And then, uh, you know, people just really, really enjoy all the quirky things and really embrace it. And nobody's taking themselves too seriously here, which is. Yeah, the best it might part. be the dorkiest state now that I think totally, about it. Totally, totally. And, and, you know, that, that's great. That's uh, and I think that's the underlying vibe is life's too short to take yourself too seriously, you know? Yeah. And I feel like all growing up i felt like especially in music i felt like like everyone wanted to be like a cool or fashionable band or a fashionable artist or be kind of in the in the trends mm -hmm. and i don't know if that's if that's what it was like then but it certainly seems like people are embracing like the the geekier nerdier like less cool is now cool almost 
Yeah, and I think that it is cool. I mean, unique is cool and different is cool. And not just being different for the sake of being different, but really what it is is saying, who am I? You know, and not being afraid if who you are is not perceived as cool, but just it comes down to truth, I think. And yep. and just embracing your truth as unglamorous as it is. And if you embrace uh, it enough, it becomes glamorous to a sen- in a sense, you know, yep. but a different yep. kind of glamour, I guess. Yeah. And and so much of perceived success now is in data and metrics because we can all see the numbers online, which isn't so healthy. But I think if uh, one thing I would say to anyone who's like a creator or an artist out there is that it's so much better to be, to have your own thing, your own unique thing, your own style, your own voice, and just have not people get it as much, not be like any bigger success, than be like a big thing and just be a carbon copy of something else. Because that's like your thing. That's, that's you. That's what you have. And if someone wants that, they have to go to you to get it. They have to go to the source, you know, and be like, I need the stuff. I need your painting or your song or your comic comedy and um i I just i think that's so that's so critical and that's the kind of stuff that wins out in the long run totally uh and what you're talking about i think is intellectual property and i you know i talk to a lot of people um who and i did for a while i'll just stick with me i wanted to be an actor for some time or a host or something like that i wanted to work for like mtv or i wanted to be on a big film or whatever, or, you know, some show, SNL or whatever. And now I don't think I would take those jobs at all because it just takes me away from doing my thing. And, um, you know, intellectual, if you have a show that you've developed that's good or an internet following that you've developed that's good, uh, even if it's a small uh, following, you know this, you can sell merch, you can sell your your stuff, you can make a very viable business off of it. And you don't have to be a mega star, but you can slowly build your brand to a point where um, it is just, you could get just as many views as an SNL uh, sketch or whatever. And it's not, I'm not going to say it's easy, but if you enjoy the craft, it's not hard. It's very enjoyable. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, punching someone else's clock on a job and like working towards someone else's mission is, I think it's good in small doses if you really believe in it. But yeah, to have your own thing is, is so critical because it's, that's some, that's an investment that, is not short term. That's, that's, that's for the long haul. Definitely. And I've worked for, I mean, I worked for MTV and I've worked for, you know, um, some, some bigger companies, uh, I've done shows for like, um, uh, CBS sports network or Fox sports or whatever. And you're all, or I was always paranoid that I was going to lose my job, you know? Oh, yeah, and, me too, me too. And I eventually lost my job in all those situations, you know? And the nice thing is when you are dictating your path, you can be more creative in your path, you know? So let's say YouTube views are down or whatever. You you know, you say, okay, how do I get these up? But then how do I diversify? How do I get another platform that maybe things pop off more on? Maybe it's TikTok, maybe it's Instagram, you know? So yeah. there's a lot of ways to be more creative so you don't really lose your job. It is scary to have bosses. I was always terrified. Even if they were nice, I was like so scared of them. I know. You know? I know. Well, and I think that when you your well-being relies too much on one entity, i.e. a boss, then that puts you in a, a mental space of needing to please uh, your boss as opposed to needing to do the best work and taking risks. You know, that's why you see a lot of times at the executive level, uh, you see a lot of fears about picking up a certain show uh, because it, there's, you know, the last thing an executive wants to do is to pick up a show and have that not be successful. Their job could be on the line. So there's right. a little bit, not not in every executive, but that that's, a, you know, a thing in, 
in LA, um, there's a hesitancy to take risks at the highest levels. So it's better for you as a creator to take those risks, to build a following, show the numbers are there, and then maybe you'll get some picked up. But if you don't, you got the numbers there anyway, you know? So yep. you And there, there is, I, I think I'd tell anyone who's kind of doing their own mission creatively or even like an entrepreneurial mission that I feel like there's like this five year, like, hard grind like the first five years i know for me and a lot of my comrades were just tough you know i mean fun and exciting and novel and like thrilling but like you know kind of brutal you know just being a you know somewhere in oklahoma like sleeping on a pube infested couch at a punk squat being like <laughs> what, what am i doing like i'm a failed man oh, and then yeah. it's kind of like you know, one, one week, one year, you, all of a sudden you start to feel that corner turn and you're like, all right, I'm not broke anymore. <laughs> and I'm making a pretty good living. It's like, it's, it's happening. I'm not a, I'm not a huge deal. I'm not like selling out massive halls, but it's like happening. I'm doing it. And, um, yeah, you, you, you gotta stay in the game. You know, it's just, it's staying in the game. It is staying, and very early on, and I remember when I first moved to L.A., I, um, you know, in this minivan I got from my dad because I accidentally shot with a shotgun, um, I <laughs> just remember waking up one morning in L.A., and my buddy who I was crashing with, he wasn't at the spot, so I ended up, you know, I slept in the van, which I did on occasion, you know, if I couldn't yep. find a place to crash, because I had no money. But I remember just waking up in the back of the minivan on some street in Santa Monica and just, you know, just having the sun, the sun like waking me up. And I just opened my eyes and it's just like those natural grain granola bars that I got for free at the job I had. Just the <laughs> crumbs and, and then a pellet from the shotgun blast that hadn't been cleaned out, you know. <laughs> and it's just like that was the first thing I saw in the morning. And I, at the time I was just like, Oh my gosh, what am I doing with my life? But now I look yeah. back and I'm like, that, that is a great memory. Oh yeah. And I think that's what you have to remember that. Yeah, it is hard. It's very hard for those first few years, but I think you have to embrace that and let that, you know, that difficulty be there and be okay with it. And the worst thing you can do, and this is what I struggled with because Facebook was, you know, out at the time or whatever. And all my, you know, friends I grew up with were posting that they just got hired at this job and that job, you know, somewhere buying cars and whatever. And you want to compete with that. And that's the worst thing you can do. Don't ever compare and compete with people on social media and totally um that's i think you know social media has a lot of good things but that is definitely the downfall of it if we yeah there's there's not i mean 90s success was very different than the t success in the 2000s and onward you know because you would be swept up in the pop culture you would be this massive thing and now it's like you it's all about like the tiny victories the micro victories and you know mm -hmm. in that regard yeah speaking of funny um places you've crashed on the road do you have any other like funny like horrifying places that you've uh, <laughs> crashed on like a comedy tour or something early on yeah they're a bunch they're a bunch um oh man uh there was this one uh, in uh, Kansas City, I remember. I, was, I played a house show. It was like maybe like the seventh show I ever did in my life. And I was playing with like hardcore punk bands. And I mean, you know how disgusting carpet is just in general. Mm -hmm. But like this is like a punk house squat carpet shag oh, no. carpet. And everyone's oh, no. crashing on the oh. carpet. And there's like these four other hairy guys from Oklahoma sweating and like drinking booze on the floor next to me so i like i went upstairs to like try to find some quiet place and you know i brushed away all these like pizza boxes and like weird broken action figures and like just huddled in a corner and curled up in the in a ball and like i would go to the go to the bathroom to take a whiz and like it was like a pube graveyard oh, i mean it was geez. like it was like somebody wasn't even it was like someone was intentionally like running around the the whole bathroom, just trimming their pubes and like <laughs> and like shooting them everywhere. I mean, it was like un unreal. The old um, pube gun, yeah. 
the pube gun. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, I wish that was a unique experience, but there was uh, there was many of those. Yeah, no, I've definitely had a few of those. I mean, um, one place that comes to mind is I played Rookies in Stevens Point. It was one nice. of my first shows. And they've got this house out back uh, that, or like this apartment behind it. That's just, man, it, 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 uh, you just had to be in there. I don't really know, but that was that was where we were. Uh, I think crashing that night. But I think someone called an audible at that point because uh, we we decided yep. that we were going to take some of the merch money and get a an, uh, hotel for the evening. Uh, but yep. there, there's that. There's um, you know sleeping on buddies tour buses, which are obviously you know it's a whole mess in and of itself. Um, you know, sleeping on the ground of a tour bus, uh, camping, it's audible. sometimes camping. it's, uh, sleeping. Oh, Oh, this is a good move. This is a good move. So this, um, I wasn't on the road, but I was living in South Carolina and, uh, I also just got a job in DC, but I was kind of working both in South Carolina and DC, oddly enough. So I, uh, to get to DC, obvious, I don't know how long, 10 hours, maybe I forget the yeah, drive, that's a haul. but I would drive and then I would sleep at, um, like the holiday Inn off the highway, like in some the parking lot in the parking lot. But then here's the move. Here's the move. Free continental breakfast. Yes. Free pool, you know, free shower. So you sleep in the parking lot. You wake up, walk in, you got your free breakfast. Ooh. Yeah, that's... Wait, you, where's the shower? In the pool? Uh, yeah, where the pool is the shower. <laughs> <laughs> I love a sauna. I feel like the sauna is the best therapy of all time. Yeah, a sauna is great. They, this one did not have a sauna, you know, but uh, if I'm sure there's a Holiday Inn with a sauna. Uh, should I do a disclaimer that this is illegal, or do you think people understand that? Yeah, I, I think it. I think it's. Uh, I think they know. But yeah, I love a Holiday Inn. I grew up going to them. Um, and yeah, I, you know, see, I'm a fan. Like being from the Midwest, kind of a blue collar family. Like sneaking into the Holiday Inn. We would always sneak into the pool when it was closed, or like for like a high school football game. Instead of paying the three bucks, we would like crawl under a doggy hole in the fence. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And my yep. pops totally like my my dad's dad like taught him that so he's like hey because they were broke as shit so he'd be like hey there's a hole in the fence uh you know just you and uh, you and your brother scooter run down there and sneak <laughs> in the game and then meet, meet me in the bleachers so my dad was all about that yeah and uh that's just that's, it was hilarious. that's like a coupon you know that's like a two for one it's you know if they're not going to fix the hole in the deal well you know that's yeah. just that's a, that's an invite is what that is and i remember it like being like you have to pay for high school sporting events. Yeah, let, let's get real about this, okay? <laughs> you know, you, you we should be able to go into those for free. Yeah, so then you get into the philo the philosophy behind it. You know, it's like this is a public school here. You know, you should yeah. be able to just get in. Public forum. Well, the worst one we ever did was. Uh, my, we were going to a Bucks game and we were a ticket short and maybe the game was like sold out or something. This must have been when they were good, when they had like Big Dog Robinson or whatever. Oh yeah, but those were the my days. My dad's like, hey Benny, to my little brother, just pretend you're sleeping on my on my shoulder and I'll carry you in. And like, he's way too big at this point. Like, my brother's probably like eight or nine. I mean, he's like a, like a large boy. <laughs> and he like, my dad carries him in, he fakes sleeping and like walks right into the Bucks game. Classic classic your your yeah, dad is a, a, a solid individual he's a legend he's yeah a legend. he's got all the uh, all the tricks are you drinking out of a, a smoothie cup there yeah a smoothie cup the pints like you just don't get enough water and you got to refill them too often yeah no you got the the big gulps what's your what's your um choice cup to drink out of uh, whatever's around, to be honest with you, I'm not a, any cup that is a choice cup, I end up breaking it or something. You're not a chalice guy or anything? No, no. I mean, it would be nice to have a good cup one day, but you know, uh, I'm not there yet. And, uh, you know, that's part of the grind, you know, that we still have. So what's the future looking like for you outside of, um, comedy and entertainment are you like you pumped to have like kids have some little shits running around or what are your oh, kind of yeah. goals outside of uh comedy yeah i'm sure all of that will happen uh eventually you know but i think you know just 
Uh, right now, I'm. Uh, yeah, it'll be. You know, I'll have those goals uh, eventually, but it's just kind of pushing. Uh, got a lot of stuff coming out right now, so you know, uh, I'll start focusing on that. You know, next couple of years. Yeah, I, I feel you. I'm there with you. Um, the the other week, I had um, I did a. Uh, a mushroom trip down at uh, South oh, Shore Park. Good down, for not, you. Not good far from you. your house. Not far yeah. from your house. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was just like, it was so, f- it was fun and it was, and it was beautiful. I was sitting out at the, um, looking over the lake and like, I was just like, it just like crushed me like how hard it was to be a little kid. And I had this, this vision from being in first grade and I think I talked about this on the pod once, but like, I don't know what class were you, did you have Bukowski for first grade? Were you in my class? I am Miss Gunther. Okay. So we were in the room next to you, but uh, Bukowski, I mean, hate to call her out with her real name here, but Ooh. she was a scary lady. Holy. I mean, I don't know what was going on. She was burnt out. She was at the end of her teaching career, I guess, but yeah. we would only get three seconds to drink at the water bubbler at the water fountain. I kind of remember it was like, that. Yeah, it was like the heat of summer. And this is like the pre-water bottle era. So it's September 6th. It's scorching hot. It's like 96 in the classroom. All the kids were toddlers, were so thirsty, so thirsty, brutal. So I remember I was waited in line to get a drink from the water. And instead of sitting there for three seconds drinking, I spent like two or three extra seconds, like five seconds at the bubbler. And she stopped the class and she scolded me in front of the whole class as being a selfish young man for drinking more water and taking more water from the other kids. And I was oh crying. I was crying in the, I mean, that's, the that's pretty hell? horrifying, right? Yeah. And you the kids should, were, should be called out. That's messed up. The kids, Sue Blakowski, the kids were, uh, she, were she all terrified. <laughs> I'm and, sure she's uh, a fine woman, a bad uh, day. Yeah, I'm sure, she, I'm sure she's all right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we would have to fake, we would have to fake that we had to go to the bathroom so we could go in the hallway and get a drink of water. And she, she caught on to this. So she would like look down the hallway to see if we were like sneaking water or not. And I saw, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, so. That's... that's that's I do I do remember now that you bring that up water being a uh a thing you know that it was like I remember being thirsty a lot in school what a dumb thing to do why would you make kids thirsty you know yeah no they're not gonna pay attention to anything bunch of dehydrated yeah seriously (laughs) that is what it is it's like these this isn't uh basic training exciting remember how exciting it was to like go do the bathroom break because it was the only time you didn't have parental supervision basically oh yeah and you could just you could just <laughs> write on the walls you know do whatever you wanted there were there yeah. was uh, oh mess or remember the the cloths you would pull down oh yeah like, yeah, cleaning, yeah they still have those or did they finally realize those things weren't sanitary those were always nasty from the beginning i think they're done their their time is up um but you environmentally know, buddy, a nice thing though you know now that i'm thinking about it right yeah well-intentioned well-intentioned yeah, yeah. i had this buddy uh andy schaefer my my kind of my first friend do you remember andy schaefer um no well he he had this ability like when during bathroom break he could like his his ray of urine like he mm. could pee like for like 11 feet long so he would stand at the other end of the Uh, bathroom and pee across the whole bathroom into the urinal which was amazing you know and i think that i knew a fellow like that and that's when you realize that you know god was not handing out all all talents to everybody you know and that that was probably one of the first disappointments of my life to realize that i didn't have that skill set but yeah you know you know you when you have limited ability at you know certain things you kind of you double down on other things like um if we're talking about like elementary school toilet terrorism like Mm -hmm. my buddy brad nilon like he couldn't pee as far but he would take um he would wet the toilet paper and then throw it on the ceiling and make uh, shapes and drawings and people loved him for that and really that that you know goes to show um whatever your uh, yeah if you are weak in one area you are strong in another and you just have to find that and it's amazing the lessons we learned in the bathroom in first grade you know mm-hmm. double down on your strengths outsource your weaknesses <laughs> 
That could be a, a bumper sticker. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, cool, man. We've been riffing, I think, a good 50 minutes. Um, do you have any projects you want to like tell, oh, yeah, tell yeah, the yeah, people yeah. about? Yeah, got an album coming out with Adam Gruel from Horseshoes and Hand Grenades. Uh, it comes uh-huh. out on the 23rd. And uh, yeah, it's I actually got a little uh, uh, thing of it here. Uh, it's called Unthawed. So it's, um, you know, it's some Midwest tunes and it's got some country and some bluegrass vibes to it. That's uh, and, you know, it's kind of a fun thing for me. I've always wanted to uh, put out an album and, uh, you know, this was a lot of fun. I've always been, you know, writing songs since I was a kid. So uh, we'll see how it's uh, how it's received you know sweet man is it uh is it comedy based or is it more just rock and roll country kind of stuff uh you know there's definitely comedic elements in it but there are some songs that you know can stand on their own as a song uh we actually just released ope nope today which i think is probably the one of the best songs on the album and uh it's it's cool it's it's i think it's legitimately a good song um again some comedic elements in it but um definitely not the the basis of the song did adam produce it or where'd you where'd you record yeah we recorded over uh in wauwatosa uh what's the which studio is that oh wire and vice Holter? yeah yeah wire and vice yeah, he's yep. good he's yep. great great guy i've uh, worked with ian, him before well ian was producing uh, uh or he was in the booth and then i would say you know because we didn't record all the songs there but um I, you know um, yeah. So I, I'm new to this, so I don't know who the producer was necessarily. Ian Olvera, he's great. He's a genius. Mm-hmm. But a well, lot of it, talented people there. So yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me on, man. This this was uh, this was a lot of fun. It's good to catch up it. like this. Let's let's team up for a rock and roll show at some point. I love it. That would be very yeah. fun. Uh, we got Charlie vaccines Barons. out, so yeah. Dirt from the road, Manitowoc minute. Charlie B. Good talking to you, man. Brett, take it easy, man.